My name is Nathan Borok Stockheim, son of Bernard Borok Stockheim. The family, if you look at the family tree, so it was wall-to-wall -wall rabbis going all the way back. But my father's grandfather was the black sheep, and he wasn't a rabbi. Not only wasn't a rabbi, he was rather worldly. The son, Mordecai Zakheim, was also a worldly man, and he, he had a huge business. The family ran one of the largest businesses in Poland. He married and then had four children. His wife died, as was often the case in those days. So he, at the age of 43, married an 18-year-old girl. She went on to have six children, my father being the youngest of the six. When he was a teenager, he was granted the best art studio in Poland. He later joined the army revolution of General Pilsudski and began to carry a pistol, became a persona non grata all the way around. And when Pilsudski joined the Polish government against the uh, Germans, he became wanted by the Polish government and the Germans, spent several stints in war prison. But then after the third time he was in war prison, he went to uh, Danzig, which is now called Gdansk, and studied with Enrico uh, Glichtenstein. You'll see the strong influence of Glichtenstein in my father's sculptures. Glichtenstein typ typically took a block of wood, and when he finished with it, it still looked like a block of wood. In other words, he took very little wood away. So Glichtenstein was his mentor, and when he was living there, he was joined by his fiancée, his first wife, not my mother, but Masha's mother. They sold a business in Warsaw, and his cut was $20,000. He then went with his bride, they got married there, went with his bride on a boat to America. And remember, he was wanted by the police, he was wanted by the Poles, he was wanted as a revolutionary, so he ended up in a really dicey spot. So with that money, he bought first-class clothes, they bought first-class tickets, and they rode first-class to America. While the boat was in the harbor of Gdansk, the Germans and the Poles and the police were rushing around searching everybody, trying to find him. But where they failed to look, was in the first class. From there, he came to New York, didn't like New York, came to Los Angeles, didn't like Los Angeles very much either, and went to San Francisco and stayed there. My grandfather Mordecai had insisted that each of them learn a trade. My father learned the trade of upholsterer. He started a furniture manufacturing company that became incredibly successful within a few years. He had boutiques in the corners of the Macy's and the City of Paris and other Tony stores in San Francisco. And he became a multimillionaire within four years. So when he came out to America, he was very young and he was always painting prolifically. In 1929, Rivera invited him to come and live with him. And he went down to Mexico and spent, I think, six months or a year with, living with Rivera where he met Viktor Arnatov and all the others that were in the atelier of Rivera. So then he went to Paris for a year. And he locked himself in a room in Paris because he wanted to find his palette. But his strong influence at that time, traveling through Italy and Europe, was the, the art of Fra Angelico, Giotto, and he became strongly influenced by their two-dimensionality and also very strongly influenced by their palette, which was earth tones used in fresco. His first fresco was painted in a church in Hungary. Apparently during the war, the wall had been demolished and rebuilt, so his fresco was gone. His first wife, not my mother, was there in charge of everything the business while he went to Paris for a year. This is my father's first wife's brother. He was one of the ones that uh, talked uh, my dad's first wife into investing in the stock market in Luton, whereby they lost every penny of their money. My father painted his first fresco in the United States, which was at the Jewish Center in San Francisco.
Coit Tower, Lily Coit, donated a large sum of money. Fleischacker owned a large cement business. So Fleischacker built the monument. And he called to my father, get a group of art, communist artists to decorate it. The reason why is he thought they're busy out in the streets agitating. But if we have them inside a building, they won't be able to agitate. They'll be too busy painting to agitate. Well, as history would have it, they painted such controversial pictures that all the newspapers were running pictures of them if their political views became a total embarrassment to the standing in Toland Hall at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco in a room full of frescoes. These frescoes were by Bernard Zackheim. He painted them in 1935 to 1938, showing the history of medicine in California. I'm Masha Zackheim, his daughter, and I have learned a great deal about California history through these murals. They had a great deal of controversy attached to them, even from the beginning when they were painted some of the subjects that my father chose, and then later the egos of some of the lecturers here in the hall uh, who wanted to be the center of attention, not having students looking at murals, and therefore the murals were covered over from 1948 until 1962. But generally the idea was the brainchild of Dr. Chauncey Leak who was a professor in the pharmacology department. He said, our students come here, spend four years in whatever school, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dental school, whatever, and they leave the university and nothing draws them back. So what we need are some examples in art for them to look at while they're here and to come back to see. So my father, who was born in Poland in 1896, did not grow up in California, knew nothing about medicine, actually studied enough of the history here to pick out vignettes that he thought uh, would illustrate the history of medicine. What he told me was that he thought they were self-explanatory because in each panel he put in little anecdotes from California medical history with uh, small papers and, and little signs and boxes with names on them and so on to identify the figures. I'm afraid that years later we don't know these figures at all and therefore we need somebody to explain them. There are two names that stand out. The name of this hall Toland for Dr. Hugh Toland, who was a pioneer doctor, and Cole, our Beverly Cole, for whom Cole Hall is named. The murals aren't in Cole Hall anymore. Uh, they're in um, Health Sciences West, room 300 and 301, but they were in the old medical building, which is torn down. My father described Toland Hall as a half drum which has the sunburst ceiling, and in order to create panels, he simply extended the sunburst from the ceiling down the walls and created pilasters that gave him six panels in the back. And he then divided the front part into four panels, so he has a total of 10. He began in the back with the Native Americans of California. On the left-hand side, he fanned into the murals showing Northern California medicine. On the right-hand side, he shows Central and Southern California medicine. The panels in the front deal with the history of this institution, the University of California, the Hooper Institute, his imagined um, 
future in 1938, the beginning of World War II. And then the far right panel deals with early San Francisco medicine. Panels, each one of them is divided into three sections. On the far right, we had the Native American greeting the sun. The middle is the um, scene of Sir Francis Drake and an autopsy. Then Father Sarah is in the far left corner of that panel with um, friendly local inhabitants who are giving him medicinal herbs. Here we see some of the first doctors to arrive, mostly through the gold rush. In the panel called Indian Childbirth, which was my father's favorite panel, we see four Indian shamans or shamans dancing in the background with medicinal herbs. The panel that we're looking at now shows the work of the University of California as a research institute. And the cluster in the center, who are all in white coats, were famous physicians here. Dr. Langley Porter is a pediatrician who was interested in childhood neurological problems for whom our Langley Porter Institute is named today. Dr. Herbert Moffitt is to his right, and he's the name with whom we associate uh, Moffitt Hospital. As a counterbalance to the academic and theoretical medicine that uh, prevailed here at the university campus, we have real life medicine out in the community. This composition is similar to the one of the library. We have the sort of fan shape pivoted with this rat. The rat's an ambiguous figure because it can be a laboratory animal, but it's also here a symbol of disease because the rats carried fleas who spread bubonic plague. And we had an outbreak of plague in 1900 in San Francisco. At that time, its only victims were Asians. And the governor of the state, Governor Haight, said that um, we don't need to worry about the plague in 1900. It's just uh, an exotic disease that won't affect the natives here. But we found out later that it broke out again after the earthquake and fire of 1906. It broke out in 1907, and they had to deal with it. But this particular vignette shows um, the earlier attack of plague. In 1937, Zackheim decided to give prestige to the local WPA and turn the project over to them, and it uh, now is considered sponsored by the WPA. The final panel that we're looking at here was my father's interpretation of the beginning of World War II. We had already had the Civil War in Spain. You can see La Pachinaria, a nurse uh, taking care of a patient there. In the, and the scientists are there doing their work. He's included the names of famous scientists like Newton, Lavoisier, Einstein, and Rinken, and so forth. And whether they're endeavors would lead ultimately to a lasting peace or whether they would be used for war. It was the eve of World War II. It's a question as to whether we're going to have war or peace. In May of 1943 uh, was the fall of the Warsaw Ghetto, where 300 members of my immediate family died. I was born in December of 1943. So my father changed very dramatically after that, his mother being killed. And his atheism became much deeper. Because he said, my mother was such a religious woman, if there was a god, why would he allow her to die? My father admitted this high-pitched, hysterical scream that he that didn't hear you couldn't hear he was he was just the way his feelings were you know and he painted prolifically on holocaust themes up to that time
He went back and told his family, leave in 1939. It's not like the other times. It's not like a pogrom where some people die, some people live, and you keep on going after the smoke clears. It's totally annihilation. Get out of here. They said, well, our people have always been in this situation. The angel of death has always passed over. We can't leave. They, they own seven city blocks of Warsaw. We can't leave the businesses. We can't do that. He said, you'll die. Leave. Take money. Do what you have to do. Get out. He made his monument to the Warsaw Ghetto, which is now at Mount Sinai Cemetery. The central figure who is surrounded by spikes, the little boy, that is the central theme or the heart of this exhibit. And that one my father called genocide. Genocide is always the, kill, the killing of a child because even elderly people are children as much as the children they produce and the children they produce are children. So genocide really means killing children. That's the ultimate point of it. Now different people showed up uh, at that time. The man in the back has a cannon on his shoulder. He joined the resistance. He's a revolutionary and he's ready to fight for the freedom and the lives of his fellow people. The man with his thumbs in his belt, my dad named him not involved. The woman behind is lacing up her bodice with laces. She is ready to sacrifice everything. Her, her breasts were symbolizing her womanhood. She's binding them so that she can fight alongside with the men. Now in the front, is the Orthodox Judaica holding the Holy Torah. As far as he's concerned, these comings and goings in this world are not of great consequence. So they come, so they go. But he keeps the Torah. He's keeping the faith, keeping the flame, the, the spirit of the Jude Jewish religion. Uh, come hell or high water. So he's not involved in the picture. But my father's uh, background in Orthodox Judaism and his rejection of religion altogether and became becoming somewhat of an atheist, to him that was another sign of weakness. He looked at that man as a weak person because he could not fight for his people. Uh, of course, people are defined by their beliefs, so he was keeping their beliefs, so it's a little hard to say what the real story is there. Last but not least is this teenage girl up on the hill. I don't see it in her hand, but she had a cloth and in it a butcher knife. And she has naked breasts. What she would do is seduce the SS men. She was an assassin. These are all concentration camps. Dachau. Dublinka was the closest to Warsaw, so I imagine that my ancestors, the family, all died there. Okay, was a teacher at the California School of Fine Arts, which is now the Art Institute. And Rivera came up and made the fresco there. In the last 10 years, I became aware that my father had designed the sketch, which he presented to Rivera as a joke, of Rivera painting himself into the fresco. Rivera liked the sketch so much that he painted himself into the fresco. So now we have a picture of Rivera sitting on a plank overlapping into towards the audience, painting, and that was from the sketch. My mother and father both refused to sign the loyalty oath, the result of which was automatically being barred from teaching. So he went from making money as a teacher to not making money doing anything because of his age. 
he couldn't get a job even as an upholster at the bench. When my father could not teach, towards the end, and he was around 60 years old, he just had to feed his family. We've been living on practically nothing. Practically nothing means we lived on $25 a week. He finally bit the bullet, signed the damn loyalty oath, and began teaching. His relationship with my mother was very uh, choppy. They really began to have differences when I was five, and they stopped living together in any meaningful sense of the word when I was 12. When I was being raised, he lived in San Francisco, in essentially, we, it was run-down Victorian buildings. He'd rent a room in a run-down Victorian building for very, very cheap, five, ten dollars a month. And he would paint and carve prolifically there. The all mo more modern themes. He would just paint and paint and paint. Or paint it a lot. But in the 60s, he began painting in the Huntington and Hartford Foundation. He was in a house designed by Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's son. And he painted this 30 paintings of extreme life expression. So I like to think that he went through the death of the uh, Holocaust and came out with life. My father stayed at Farm Arts from 1943 onward to the late 70s. Shortly after that, he had a heart attack. And uh, no one expected him to live. After six months, so we went back up onto the farm. And myself, my brother, and my mother had already moved to Santa Barbara, so he had the farm to himself. I went up to visit him after he'd been there for six months. And he put up an enormous painting of a rooster crowing, and he did huge sculptures all over the place. Not able to live six months, dying on the ICU. And now he's there carving 15-foot ice sculptures. So that's how he spent his last days until the stroke. He was right in the middle of a large granite sculpture about six or seven feet high and about eight feet wide, solid. It's still there for very understandable reasons. No one has figured out how to move it yet. He started out with his classic paintings and his frescoes, the historical. And then, after 1943, he painted Holocaust themes in Little Alps. After that, he painted socially conscious work. And then, when the 60s came around and the hippies became prominent, he began painting these transcendent themes of flowers and surreal pictures of life bursting out of death. Even in the 40s, he pictured crematoria with trees that had burned and the crematoria were burned down themselves. And the trees are bursting with red stars, that the dead trees in this crematorium are bursting with life. And he painted another picture during those late 40s of hands, fists, and hands uplifted. And he called it in the affirmative. And or each one is a language that says yes. And he wrote on it, worship through work. My father, being a communist, was also an atheist. But he had a tremendously spiritual nature. So he said, worship through work. He saw that the hands moving was the actual religion of the people. So it's a little hard to describe. It's very hard to put a pinpoint his work. He always had two or three canvases underway. He did a lot of sculpture, choosing life out of death. Going back to his Orthodox Jewish roots of Chai, Chai the Ches Yod, it's from the covenant of God. He said, I give you a choice, a blessing or a curse. The blessing is life, and I ask you to choose life.